question? If not, I will forget. Yeah. Because <laughs> we don't want a doggy barking. Pero... Okay. <laughs> I am outside. <laughs> so when you get the Let camera me... fixed, hold them uh, up. <laughs> I need to. <laughs> Just a second. Let me turn it off. Oh, my God. Está bien, está bien. Crazy. Just this. I am bad in this. Oops. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, we'll get started because I know we only have an hour for today. This is going to be a very powerful conversation. Welcome, everybody. And as people still join, we're excited to have you here because this is such a powerful conversation. We talk about this all the time throughout all of the other months and then may happen. And we realize it's mental health awareness and it's up to us to really steer these conversations and make sure that this is the opportunity for us to do it without feeling the, the gist of, should we bring this up? Because some of these conversation has happened to be like, should we talk about it? Should we not talk about it? Does, how does it position us? Uh, because some of this conversation can be scary for many people to have, um, let alone our, our wonderful panelists, right? There's a sense of vulnerability when we think about having a conversation around mental health. Mm. Um, and for some data statistics, for some of you, one in five uh, women are suffering with mental health, some type of mental health concern, right? And that can be an array of different issues that we'll, we'll address and kind of go over some of those. Um, but women of color specifically are 30 times more likely to have mental health over white women, uh, have some more additional stresses, right? Because we deal with a lot of cultural baggage and a lot of, uh, you know, just a, a culturalization, right? Where we're trying to acclimate to an environment, this American environment that is uh, ideally not our home environment right and I, I Alejandra I know you have the word for it um but uh but so we welcome to uh this United Latinas mental health leadership and work because how does mental health impact our work right how does it allow us to be better leaders or inhibit us so these conversations are uh critical for us I'm to join in a call without being part of it and I'm excited to to have everybody here um, all right, so we'll do um, a quick introduction. Um, we'll start. Um, Ileana, do you want to share something before we start with our panelists and, and sharing? Yes, absolutely. Welcome, everybody. We're so excited. This is going to be going to be one of several panels that we'll be having, not only for mental health, but as we move forward, because we feel like, you know, having these conversations are very important. And the other thing that I want to share is we're doing this, as you can see, and not in webinar format, we're doing it in meeting format, because we believe it's important to be able to have those conversations back and forth. So this is going to be a fluid conversation. Obviously, we're going to have a topic that's going to run through uh, part of the session today with our panelists and our experts. But we also invite you to ask questions, to connect, so that we make this more of a integrated, uh, you know, uh, conversation with all. So this that's that's the intention of today. So let me start inviting our panelists in. We have um, there we go, Lisette Ibarra, who is the CEO of Latina Chi. We have Dr. Alejandra Mielke. Uh, who is from um, El Puente Institute and Bridgeify and uh, your own coaching firm, a leadership coach. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we have Dr. Pat Baxter as well. Oops. Wait, did I lose you somewhere? Hold on. I'll bring you back. Give me a second. But we have Dr. Pat. Baxter over here. There we go. Um, there we go. Okay, we're all now, sorry, we're trying to figure out this new Zoom environment to try to make it work. 
So welcome, everybody. We're excited to have you all here. Um, and we're going to kick off the conversation in a not necessarily in a traditional way. We would love to hear from all of you sort of why you're so passionate about this conversation. Uh, like, like Sandra very well put at the beginning, this is a conversation that many of us for different reasons. It's something that we don't bring up, but we all suffer in silence in the back. <laughs> so I think it's important to showcase why uh, why it's important to, to each of us, right? Because uh, maybe there's a story there that we all connect through. So would love to start with you, Dr. Pat. Muted. <laughs> um, this is... This is a uh, a topic of passion for me for, for several reasons. Number one, my field, which is uh, emotional intelligence, women, and the workplace. That is a dynamic. That is something that is like a, a, a whirlpool uh, between relationships that work and don't work, work, work itself that doesn't work or works, and what we bring to the to the workplace in our own minds and our own hearts and our own bodies. Uh, and I also have uh, a particular interest in, in this because I have seen mental illness in my family. And there are aspects of it that caused me to start to study emotional intelligence, emotions, and its effect on our physical bodies as well as our selves in, in terms of our intellect. So that's that's where I started, and my work is is totally around supporting women in the workplace. Um, and I want to be the resource that I never had growing up on Wall Street. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pat. Lisette, how about you? Ah, uh, well, thank you. I'm super happy uh, to be here with you today. This is a topic that I've uh, been very passionate about for the past few years, uh, pretty much as Dr. Pat is saying, because I've I've seen loved ones and I've experienced myself, uh, you know, some, I, I don't know if I could call it mental health issues, but for, for instance, I started su suffering insomnia a few years ago and it's really starting, you know, to make my life uh, more challenging. But during that insomnia period, I started to hear a lot of podcasts and, uh, you know, videos on mental health. So I, uh, through my insomnia sessions, I learned a lot about it and, and that's what part of it. But the other part is that I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur for the past 15 years. I've been working my entire life. I am also a mom. I am also a wife. So I think that itself brings a lot of uh, mental burden that we don't talk about. And especially we're going to delve uh, a lot more into the topic. But what the, does that mean for Latinas, especially with the role models that we uh, were brought up? So uh, to me, especially, I'm not a physician. I'm just, you know, super passionate about the topic. But again, as an entrepreneur, as a working mom, as a professional, I think this is a super important topic. And Thank I just want to chime in that, like insomnia, like many of us are dealing with, I'm going through that right now. I was, yes. I was telling Diana, like, I'm literally on such a minimal sleep with, and we know it's not good, but the same thing, I'm a podcasting and listening and trying to figure that out, but right. why, how do we heal that part of ourselves? Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. sure many others are silently suffering as well with that. So awesome. Alejandra. Um, Yes, well, happy to be here. Glad to have this conversation. And uh, as I was thinking about it, and and um, I, I mean, of course, it's it's very personal. Uh, I don't think I have shared this a lot, but I moved here from Monterrey, Mexico, to twenty four years ago, and uh, it was I mean, I and I already had English, and I had visited the city many times before. I had friends here, and it was still a cultural shock, right? So that whole program, the university, the new environment, the new way to do things from making friendships to thrive in the workplace and all that was very, very difficult to the point that I ended up, of course, contacting the mental health department of the university. They had a clinic and uh, and I can't remember exactly what was the 
the thing that happened that made that happen, but I'm very grateful that I did. And they they did send me to a, a therapist, a counselor that that a psychologist that I that I saw for more than 10 years. So it was quite a long experience, but I could not be here and talking to you if it wasn't for that man. That was actually a man. He was not even a Latino, but he was able to help me a lot. So I I've talked about this to some of my friends and I've always say it, please reach out to others. We cannot do this sometimes on our own. And sometimes we insist on doing it on our own. We insist on trying to find our own ways to uh, to help ourselves. And sometimes we need the expert or the, or the someone else there who might not one or two more things about this. So uh, yeah, that, that experience was very extremely ridiculously helpful to me. But I also saw so many times how a lot of my Latina friends or colleagues or clients do have certain hesitations to reach out for that extra help, right? There's a lot of stigma around it. There is like, ah, I'm fine. It's not until they really get to a breaking point when sometimes they reach out and I, I it's not necessary to get to that point. So I think it's, it's important to realize when we can get help and act and be brave because it's it's about how be brave having that courage to say like yes i need the help because it really can make a big difference absolutely mm -hmm. and you know like latinas are more likely to experience anxiety and ptsd for many of the issues that you mentioned you know the acculturation um just issues in workplace not feeling like they're enoughness um, and let alone all the other things when it comes with motherhood and being kind of ahead of a household. Mm -hmm. And Latinas mm -hmm. are less likely to seek mental health treatment or to even speak to anybody, like you mentioned, uh, which is why we need each other and had to have these conversations because, you know, if you're not going to mm -hmm. go speak to somebody, um, which you should, right? We should all get comfortable with that. But our culture doesn't allow, you know, I don't know, it's implanted. I don't know what it is. <laughs> We're gonna bring it <laughs> oh, yes, it is. And if I can continue on that topic, Sandra, I think that it is extremely important to talk about that element that we have it in all of us, that sometimes is a big elephant in the room, that is the aspect of culture. Our culture are, mm -hmm. is has a lot of cultural scripts, cultural messages that we hear about us, specifically us women, of being perfect, right? Of being uh, as, mm -hmm. as close to perfection as possible. And uh, in, in my work, we talk about cultural drivers, these cultural scripts. And the one that comes to mind now is the cultural script of Marianismo, that it comes from the Virgin Mary and that that ideal that we have in our country is to be as close as possible to that pure image, pure uh, concept of the Virgin Mary. And we are constantly in pursuit of that. And then that's why we have then perfectionism and, and guilt and this anxiety because we have this idea that we have to be as close to the Virgin Mary in every single context, in our families, our immediate families, our extended families, at work, with our friends, in our community. We have this idea that we have to be everything for everyone. And it, at sooner or later, it causes a tremendous weight that we cannot carry on by ourselves. I don't know what others have to say about this. If I, if I may add uh, to it, I think there's um, a lot of stigma and also shame. I love the word shame because we, we don't talk that much about shame, that upbringing, as you very well said, Alejandra, like we have to be strong and perfect. And uh, when we're not, when we feel that mental burden and that we are being challenged by, you know, uh, mental health, then we feel weak and then we feel mm -hmm. as, as, as we are failing. And that's, that brings mm -hmm. a lot of shame and we need to talk about it. It's not shame. We shouldn't be ashamed and that's why these conversations are super important to have and and the other thing that I quite often think is 
we tend to think that our Latino culture is very macho oriented. I don't know about your situation, but in my case, I grew up in a matriarch, you know, environment. Like, you know, everything was around my grandmother and, and very strong women in my family. So, you know, this perfectionism stigma is 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 very strong as you know when i when i grew up so i think you know we we carry that into our work our leadership roles you know being the pay, the peacemakers and suppressing sometimes even uh healthy anger expressions like you know because we as women were strong and we need to keep the family together and that you know, interaction with work, it's its very challenging because we cannot divide who we are. So I think that upbringing, at least in my case, and I see it in a lot of women that I didn't grow up in a machista uh, environment. Uh, in my case, it was the other way. I'm very, very strong women. And that's a burden as well because we carry <laughs> that uh, stigma uh, with us. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And I, I'm thinking that what we are doing here today is part of what may have been missing for many members of our, our, of our respective families, and that's education. Education mm -hmm. and the, the removal of that stigma and understanding that there are resources for us. I mean, I, <laughs> I wish, I wish my, my mom knew more about the resources available to her. Instead, she would be in the botanica every weekend looking for a cure looking for a way to handle it um and sometimes she found what she needed in a whiskey bottle so managing it in a way that that we are educated about what is happening and realizing that it's not so much a, a, it's not a stigma it is it's an issue that can be handled with education and information. We're doing a very important thing here. And I wanna go beyond what you're saying about education and information. I think it's also seeing it reflected in others to make it, I don't wanna say it normalized because it's, it's not about normalization, but at yeah. least making ourselves feel like I'm not the only one because I know at least from in my case, my family was always perfect, right? And I knew it wasn't perfect, but mm -hmm. the 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 expectation of, yeah. you know, the mom, the perfect mom, the perfect dad, the perfect kids, like everything had to be perfect. So even sickness was sort of like, no, 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 I like I'm not sick. Like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, nothing's mm -hmm. happening, right? And to this day, uh just accepting that you know you're you're not feeling well can feel go goes against like those decades of what you through your family or through your the, your environment were seeing but as we go into this community i love what dulce says on the chat about marianismo because i learned it with you know with uh dr patty and you alejandra as well and that was enlightening to me because i was like Oh my God, like that answers so many questions that I had. But it's like decades and decades and decades after that you don't realize that you're going through these experiences. So I love what you're saying, Dr. Dr. Pat. It is part of this education and awareness, but also part of what being in part of this community of leaders, Latina leaders that are going through the same experiences that you're like, okay, I'm not the only one. I'm not going through the craziness, or at least, you know, not not, not on its own. <laughs> exactly. Or, exactly. Or there's a reason for that, right? There is a cool, I mean, so there I'm not crazy, even though I might be struggling, but there is a reason for that. There is this mm -hmm. uh, this cultural understanding, this cultural script that is pushing me in this direction. Or is so when you realize that, I think it whatever it is, right, the, the like the dulce put the el que dirán, el, the perfectionism, the guilt, the shame, whatever it is like, okay, so it loses some weight when we realize where it's coming from. It, it loses some of the power. It does not that the big monster that is behind us 
it is something that, okay, it comes from my culture. It comes from what I have learned. It comes from what I have absorbed. So it loses power. And um, as we say in our, in our master class, when you can name it, when it's when you are aware, then you can tame it. You can tame it in a way that is maybe less powerful, or you can tame it in a way that you can become, that it can you can make it your superpower or something, but it's not this monster there that is, um, doing things with you or to you, you are more, you are responding rather than reacting to what's to what it enables you. Yeah, it, it enables, enables you, you as opposed to disables you. Yeah, exactly. And I love like what Rosalind is also saying in the chat, right? Uh, about re the role of religion, which is very, you know, prevalent <laughs> in a lot of our culture uh, of you know, la, este, en manos de Dios, déjenlo en manos de Dios, uh, or ya Dios dirá, o Dios está de mi lado, and then you don't do anything because you're hoping for that magical um, <laughs> yeah. cure or answer, uh, and then we don't do anything about it, which we should. Um, so I think that's very important to call out. Thank you, Rosalind, for your, no, that's your comment. A, that's an important no, because like for a long time, I have felt like religion is either good to, in your, you grew up with it with a good side of it, or you grew up with a negative aspect of it, right? Like I always tell the story, uh, I was in Pentecostal church. I never forget this division of the whole thing. I was six years old sitting in the, um, in the pews, waiting for the school church bus to come pick us up. And this lady goes, you know what? You're never going to enter the, the kingdom of God. You're never going to go to heaven because your mother never baptized you. I didn't know I was not baptized. I was six, right? But <laughs> it always stuck with me that how religion can have a negative impact on people también, right? Our culture isn't always the bliss. So we have so many mm -hmm. sides of it that it's really understanding, you know, just everybody's situation and how it impacts them. Yeah. But I love um, Alejandra, the, the naming it, right? That's the point of those yeah. things is when I first heard you talk about it, what you did was we knew it. We know these things. But once you name, like when I heard you speaking about it, I was like, she put a name to what I always felt was a wrong in life, right? It was something mm -hmm. off in life. So just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so on, on that note of being able to recognize it and name it because either we hear it from somebody else or we see it reflected on others, what have what has worked for, you know, you've all you're all powerful leaders in your in your spaces. We've all gone through this, you know, superpower. I need to be the best expectation. <laughs> uh, I need to show up because if not, something's going to happen. How can we start? What do we need to keep in mind? How do we move forward from here so that we find a fine balance between being the powerful Latina that we need to be, because we still need to be the powerful Latina, breaking glass ceilings, working twice as hard, blah, blah, blah. Whether it's right or not, that's for another conversation. But keep the the, the sanity in our well-being, whether it's mental, physical, or whatever. What have each of you seen uh, that works or doesn't work? Uh, I think uh, the missing link, on that no, because I think you know, being the, the 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 Latina pride that we feel of being, you know, leaders and we make things happen is super positive. I love that piece. But the missing link, at least in my case, is setting boundaries. Like I've had this mission of that I can do it all and I can work, 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 and I can be the perfect mom and I can be the perfect entrepreneur. But for a long time, I didn't set boundaries. And I think that is the key. You can be all of those things as long as you set boundaries, healthy boundaries. And learning, for instance, um, I have a hard time saying no and, and understanding that no is a complete sentence. I tend to uh, over justify <laughs> my no's. And I, I mean, I'm not going to say my age, but something like, damn it, they said, you're this old and you still have to justify your no's. We shouldn't. And I think that is at least something that I'm trying to teach my children to start very early to recognize their needs to really, you know, keep this value of being, you know, I think that that superpower of being Latinas, women, that we can do it all is amazing as long as you have your boundaries clear. That, at least in my experience, has been the, the missing link and something we need to practice every day. 
boundaries take practice if you're if you weren't raised you know to, to to use your boundaries so we need to practice our boundaries every day I love I love that and one phrase that I I want to add to that that I heard just this past March in a in a session at side by Southwest actually um, it was about boundaries are not co-created which I <laughs> I love that that's, that's boundaries good. are not co-created so it's not about that we're going to discuss right so we can set a boundaries together no boundaries are my boundaries and i need to make sure that i understand them first that are clear with me that i uh, that i um that are i'm willing to take that, those steps as well right but those are going to be on my side they're not co-created which i think is extremely important because it's difficult it's very difficult when it's very difficult to set those boundaries, right? Because again, we want to be everything to everyone. Uh, but uh, once we understand that it is up to you, mostly to you, that it kind of like makes it at some point easier, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do Pat, do you want to chime in on that? One one thing that, that I found with the the clients I coach is the fact that, and for myself as well, um, the, we don't express empathy to ourselves, to be self-empathetic, to be supportive of ourselves, to say things like, I recognize that you're having a hard time. I understand why. I mean, if you look in the mirror, look in the mirror and say these things, I recognize why you're upset this morning. I understand what caused you to say that, um, but how how do we work from this point on? The recognition and the compassionate empathy that we need to show ourselves. It took a long time, believe me, for me to understand that it was okay to be nice to myself <laughs> and didn't need to do a lot of the self-flagellation you know oh you did it bad oh yeah it came out really sticky that was hard I mean and after a while you realize the first person I need to show mercy towards is myself so that's one thing I've I've learned along the way I I yeah. love what you're saying about showing empathy to ourselves and grace Somebody recently told me, how many times a day do you look at yourself in the mirror? And I'm like, well, I, I mean, every day in a way, because, you know, the makeup and, and they were like, no, 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 no. Like, how many times a day do you look at yourself in the mirror and talk to yourself? Mm. And I was like, I don't yes. think I've ever done that. Like, I look at myself in the mirror quickly because I'm putting the makeup on or brushing my teeth or whatever it is, but like actually looking at myself eye to eye and talking. And I did it the other day after I heard this person, it's so hard. It was so like, I could, there was this feeling of, Oh my God, I, I, I don't know what to say. It was a bit of between shame and, and guilt and like, you know, looking, looking up, looking, it, it's so important because <laughs> you're right. Like we have not learned to, or at least I realized that I had not learned to talk to myself and, and I do talk to myself like in the car, but I'm not looking at myself, uh, which is there's, there's this, yeah, there's this different connection when we allow ourselves to, to see ourselves. So I love what you're saying about that yeah, they've got a daily practice for sure like everyone commit today to look at yourself more often in the mirror and talk to yourself I know I, I was I listened to uh, Lisa Nichols there was a program I don't know I went through with her and there were three things that she said to look in the mirror and say like uh, I forgive myself like look at yourself in the mirror and for and say I forgive myself for and you have to name seven things of you forgive yourself for like whatever those things and then I commit to myself to another seven things and that's harder than you may think but the idea of looking at yourself in the mirror like you you'll get emotional probably all of you if you do it tonight you yeah. know you, you'll get emotional because you're like 
you know, you're forgiving yourself for things that we hold on to as baggage that is only weighing us down and is, is not pro allowing us to progress forward. And we need to face those things about ourselves and accept those things about ourselves because we're, we're look at us, we're all got some form of that, you know, uh, and, and it's our like, Thing that we think we have to be perfect we nothing can be wrong with us or nothing can be off with us when it's really us who are in our own way oftentimes and we have to forgive ourselves for the things that we're holding yeah. on to that we shouldn't be holding on to and we have to move forward and commit to ourselves what all these things i commit to looking at myself every day in the mirror and loving myself and talking to myself and being kind to myself and being empathetic to myself we need to do more of that so i wanted to add that yeah, I, 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 I was just going to say my I ha, every year I pick a word for the year and my word for this year is worthy. I'm I'm worthy of respect. I am worthy of caring for myself. I'm worthy of putting myself first. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's these are words that I think I feel like we tell others Mm. right it's the thing that we always always say you shouldn't feel guilty or you're awesome or you're great but then it's not the thing that we that we follow through mm -hmm. right um and but i'm reading in the, the best advice but you don't necessarily give something that. wonderful <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and sometimes and sometimes it takes uh and this is actually something that i learned from one of my clients she actually told me this years ago about how sometimes is a matter of 30 seconds of bravery, right? Mm. 60 seconds of courage. Just takes of just making one little action towards that. You don't have to go from zero to 180 in a week, right? But sometimes it's those 30 seconds that it takes for you to turn off the computer at time, at the right time and not continue working for the next two hours. Or mm. those 30 seconds that is about uh, going to bed earlier or going for a walk. Sometimes it's those 30 seconds that can really allow you to make one little tiny step towards the direction that you want, right? That is improved mental health or, or uh, more peace or whatever. But sometimes it's not big actions, which are very important, but sometimes little actions that can be very very helpful those 30 seconds of courage sometimes that's what it all takes yeah so one thing that we're we're here to talk about is leadership right and and many of us and i see like all of our participants here yeah. you're all yeah. rock stars uh in in your in your spaces not only our panelists but many of our if not all of our participants and we've seen the numbers, only less than 4% of Latinas make it to that top like senior executive letter, leadership position. Uh, but as a coach, I, I many of the Latinas that I work with or that I've interacted with sometimes say, I don't know if I wanna reach the top because there's a lot of sacrifice that's gonna be involved in terms of either I'm a kick-ass Latina in the top or I'm a mother or a partner or a significant other or family, whatever, you know, your, your personal situation in relation to people that you consider your family is. And there's a lot of sacrifices that we see many, many Latinas at the top that have to do because of travel expectations, long hours, weekends, et cetera, that they need to work. What have you seen in terms of how do you is there an ideal scenario or does it is it just like in fairy tales and and that doesn't exist either you're at the top and you give it your all knowing that you're going to sacrifice or you stay a level lower and you and you make the best out of it but, but me let me jump to that i think you know it has a lot to do it, it i i heard recently that our professional career goes backwards with our biology and you know when we have little kids and we have all this energy in the world you know to be successful like you're supposed to be super successful probably at 35 40 and at that time you might have little ones around mm -hmm. and you know once we are we have more time for ourselves probably in our 50s when our kids are older then our energy starts dropping so it's almost like a bad joke for for women uh sometimes so 
I, I do believe you have to make decisions in regards to what's important to you at that stage of your of your life. For instance, when I when I became a, a mom, and we haven't talked a lot about motherhood, but motherhood. I had I had to make a decision. I was um, I started my career in corporate, and I was one of those women that I, I saw myself at the top. Like I was dreaming very big when I started my career, becoming a CEO or a CHRO. Like I completely saw myself in corporate. But I knew when I had my first little one, the price was going to be too high, and I didn't, I didn't want to pay it. So I decided I shifted my entire career, and I became an entrepreneur, and I shifted to executive search that allowed me more flexibility of time to what was important to me at that time. But I think that is very personal, and I, it's very personal. It's a, it's a decision you have to make, and again. The priorities change as you go through life and motherhood and then your, your kids start growing up. And then I remember my aunt told me when they're little, you know, uh, they just need to be cuddled and, you know, uh, everybody can take care of them. But when they're older, when they're teenagers, then they need your presence. Like the mom needs to be. So it's it's very challenging at every <laughs> stage of life. But again, it's to me, it has been a, a, just about, you know, seeing where I am, what I want, what I'm willing to give up and what I'm not, and then starting from, from there. But it's not easy. And since we're talking about it and talking about <laughs> naming things, one thing that I learned a few years ago is to name silent work and to put boundaries into it. Um, silent work, I don't know if you've heard this, this stat, but women, we put about... 26 hours per week of silent work. What is silent work? That you're going to bed and all the dishes are still out. Like the, the meal is still out. You need to put it in the fridge. And uh, there's a you know workload of, uh, of, of laundry that you need to uh, put in the, all of those little things add up 26 hours per week uh, mm -hmm. versus men, seven or eight. <laughs> so that's huge. That blew my mind. Cause I was like, oh, why am I so tired? So. When I learned about silent work, I started to identify it and asking for help. Like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do this. We need to, to, to share this. And again, silent work is different as, as you progress in your life and your professional life, but um, it has been very important to me to understand silent work, to recognize it and to put boundaries to it. And also to decide, I'm not gonna do it. I don't care about the dishes anymore. Like, you know, there was a time in my life that I wouldn't go to bed if there were dishes <laughs> in the sink. Now, I don't care. Like they can say, I don't care. Cause you know, my mental health is more important now, so. And I wanna um, add to that silent work before I, I pass it on to others, to not only at the home, but also at work. Like oh, we sure. do a lot of silent, now that I'm hearing you, I'm like, we do a lot of silent work yes. for others because we're picking up the slack in many cases of others because they didn't finish the report, because they didn't go and do this, because mm -hmm. they didn't prep the meeting room, like things like that, <laughs> that, that we go that extra mile and that like I, if we add it on. And I don't know how many more hours, but I can absolutely. I can just imagine. Wow, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Or the empathy that goes with the empathy, right? Because sometimes, yeah. when especially when we see that, it's almost like thinking, you know, she could be going through something, or something's, you know, sometimes we we you know, you're not you you can recognize some of the things that you're going through inside someone else and be empathetic, you know, to to Dr. Pesigree is to to be more empathy, you know, have more empathy for the people around you because you never know what they're going through. I just always say, look around. Yes, any any absolutely. direction that you look around, someone is suffering. And if we can look at the world that way, we can we can look at ourselves and understand and feel more empathy for ourselves when we understand the world is suffering along with us. We're in this together to try to define who we are as human beings and what is our purpose here and what is our potential here. And now, you know, now that we recognize that it's not about being perfect and working in our own silos, but it's about understanding we're here together to be the best version of ourselves, whatever that may be, because cada persona is in their own, their own lane of trying to unravel and uncover and create that yeah. for their lives. But we should share that because mm -hmm. that contributes to helping us break through the mental barriers we build for ourselves. 
we we need to talk about that. We need to say, not not that you have to say you're suffering, but uh, you know, I'm sad or I'm confused or I'm angry about something. Getting that out, I think, is so is so important. And there are so many times I'm thinking of myself. I didn't share a damn thing because I didn't want to be seen as being weak. And I I was on, on Wall Street in, let me tell you, that's male driven. You do not want to be seen weak. And that will kill you. Eventually, it will kill you. So, you know, spiritually, <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm only saying that because it's I've been there, done that, and you know, it, 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 we need to talk about it, we and that's part of the taboo. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk about. I mean, going back to the the idea of more Latina in leadership positions of high visibility, I think it's important to talk about that. Um, a couple of things that is difficult for every woman, however, but we also have to realize that. Uh, it's a very personal decision. We want to go in that and, and take whatever it takes to reach those positions. But also we need to understand and talk more about uh, what is needed, that what kind of support mm -hmm. is needed to reach those positions. It is not going to happen with you working 60 hours a week and killing yourself. You have to be even more strategic in that, in that quest by getting support and hiring people and and, uh, and it's very practical but it's hiring a good nanny a good cook a good housekeeper and sometimes even even me saying those things now make me a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> it makes me a little bit oh how is that going to be uh seen or understood but i think it's essential to understand that yes we can do that and if we have the right support that we can and that's why I have no problem with people wanting more money in their lives, because with more money, they can hire people who can support them. They can, and in in the search for these positions that are needed, we need more Latina in these positions. We have, we want to need more of these role models. So it's good. There's nothing bad about that, but you need the support. I'm part of a Facebook group for mothers with PhDs. And the stories that I read in that group about I'm trying to finish my dissertation, I have a full-time job, I have three kids, and I don't know how to do it. You need to hire somebody. <laughs> That's yeah. the only way. You're not going to make it any other way. There is no talking to the husband to see if he can help more. No, no, no. You have to hire people. and it's, But that idea that you cannot do it all yourself is so Again, I think we're going full circle. It's so difficult to understand. You need to hire, be brave enough and vulnerable enough and, and whatever to make sure that you can have the support that you need. And I would add to, to the support two things because you're right. Like we do need the the support, external support, right? It could be mm -hmm. hiring somebody. It could be a community. It could be whatever it is, but we do mm -hmm. need that support. But we also need the support of people to tell other other people like us, right? That can tell us how to go about it. Because what I've seen is I did not know what I, I don't know what I don't know. Don't know. So sometimes right. I don't know how to ask for help because I've never asked for help, right? And until I could see it in somebody else that could tell me, hey, this is how you can go about and say to this person and go to that person and let them know you know, so that you don't feel like you're going above and beyond in a way that could hinder your career, but you're standing up your ground and you're being, you know, strong about it, firm, but not being seen as aggressive or not a team player. So I think that's where all it also becomes important where you have like these mentors, these other people that can tell you how do you go about it without without overstepping um uh, polly <laughs> sorry i'm late um thank you everyone hi i'm polly um i'm an, an investigator at the nih i wanted to just make a comment in terms of like asking for help and knowing um you know what i'm having role models i think that's very important like i remember when i first came to the nih i was a postdoc 
And I wanted to work with the person I work with because she had four kids. She was running a very successful lab, amazingly. And I needed, I wanted to know how she was doing it. Uh, and one of the things that she did, she had help. But then I also recognized that, you know, getting help is a privilege. Having been able to pay for help is a privilege that sometimes as a, as a fellow, as a minority, sometimes we jungle into so many different things and like affordability and just kind of understanding what are some of the other resources that can be utilized, that it's okay to get respite care uh, as part of like whatever, if you have insurance, like, you know, like kind of knowing all of these other things, but also recognizing that that it is a privilege that sometimes as a... Um, some people may not be able to do because, you know, they juggle in too many other things. So like kind of normalizing the fact that sometimes it's really hard as well. I just wanted to mention this because I feel like um, I see it and the struggle of some of the people that I mentor and, you know, they just can't afford $500 a month to get a cleaning service. So it's like, how do, what are some of the other strategies that we can um, come up with that can be helpful, especially when you're starting your career and kind of balancing some of those other things. Just wanted to mention that. And yeah, maybe definitely. Other have ideas. No, definitely. I just want to uh, respond to that because definitely I completely agree that there is very different uh, realities and context and uh, and privileges, right? That uh, That not everyone can have access to. But I also, uh, and I talk a lot of this with my clients, it's like, it might not be uh, ideal. I always talk about what is the unicorn that we're looking for, right? So we might not get to the unicorn, but we might get to a little pony, right? It might not be the whole unicorn, but I'll be a pony that I'd be able to help in one way or another, right? So it is, uh, I had a, a lot of, I, I just find um, this client who did some kind of exchange she would take care of some kids and then she and the other mother would take care of the kids and there would be some change. So it's, uh, there is sometimes uh, our resourcefulness comes in, right? And okay, well, let's find ways where we can do something to help each other or to help ourselves, right? But yeah, definitely not everyone has access to to those, but, but we can find ways, right? Yeah. Lisette, Dr. Patrick. You guys want to add to that? Uh, I just want to share a quick story. I think it's it's controversial asking for, but sometimes we don't even think about it. That's I think that's the entire mm -hmm. point. Like it's not about having your entire house clean up, but what about if uh, you pay, you know, for for laundry once a month? I mean, like just start with the little things that are gonna free up yeah. your time and your mind, especially your mind. So you you have the space to be more creative or just to rest or do nothing, whatever. But I think as as do it all women, we tend to think that we can do it all. And we when we realize sometimes we can hire, you know, someone or, you know, just outsource a few things, it can make a huge difference. Like when I, and I understand I had a husband and it wasn't my situation, but when, when my first son um, was born, I was, I was in corporate. So I hired a full-time nanny to help me, um, you know, during the day to take care of him. I swear, I'm, I'm, I didn't even share this for a long time, but I think I spent about 40% of my income to pay the nanny, <laughs> but I, I was able to do that because I had a husband and we didn't, you know, eat from my salary. But that allowed me to be, you know, more uh, competitive, more fully present at, at, at work and, you know, aspire to do other things. And I was lucky that I was able to do it, but it was, I didn't even share it because, you know, people was going to say, you're crazy. You're spending 40% of your income on a nanny. Yes, I did. And I'm proud I did because at that time, you know, as I, as I look backwards, it paid me back, you know, big time. So at least, at least thinking of the possibility I think it can open up a lot of uh, doors. Mm -hmm. The peace of mind, right? It, that's what you're paying for. It's the peace of mind, and we need yeah. that. We need to. We need to think that investing in things like that is for our greater good because it is. And it to, is. In, 
to and to include Russell in what your comments about co-creating our reality, everything we think, everything we feel, we are already co-creating our reality. So it's up to us to recognize that and be intentional about catching thoughts that are not doing good for us and changing those thoughts, right? Because we are consistent, everything, everything, this day, everything that you went through today is part of what's been implanted in your subconscious mind. So now that we know that, now what? Now what are you gonna do with that knowledge is now that we know that every walking moment we are consistently co-creating our life, being intentional about catching those negative things and the things that aren't serving us and saying, this thought is not serving me. I am not doing good, or I need to delegate this because this is just not happening. I'm just not, it's not working for me, or this is not where I find my flow, right? Because we want to live in our flow. That's what we strive for. Where is joy? Joy is when you're doing something and you're in your flow and you're just feeling it, right? We want to do that perpetually. Pero a veces la vida, you have all these other <laughs> you know, things along with that, right? So how do, you, how do you guys find your flow or manage your flow? And how does that... Um, uh, happen also in leadership environments or workplace environments where, you know, we, we think about mental health at work, how does that intertwine or how do you address that or think about that um, when it comes to bringing those two, two together? Finding what we want to do at the same time, if you're going through like, okay, I'm worrying about my kid while I'm at work, because I remember when my son was young and uh, those were, I'm like, I have a little toddler and I got to get there by six and he's there all day and all the stresses that happen. How do you guys, uh, like, what's your advice for how do we address that today in today's modern place of where we have a little bit more knowledge about our brains? Motherhood, oh. motherhood and the working life, yeah. right? I think is is a big challenge. And uh, I've, I've, I've said before, and I have a PhD and motherhood was 10 times more difficult than getting a PhD. I would go and get another one it, uh, again. It's so it's very difficult. And I was just having this conversation earlier today with somebody else about when you're a mother, you have this thing here, this part of your brain is completely always thinking and worrying about about your kids, right? About what you have to do. And that's also part of the style and work that we're talking about, right? And uh, uh, I think that what, uh, in my case, I'm a mother of an only child, which is another whole, another whole set of issues as mother of an only child. But I think that um, I, I, the only word that comes to mind now is intention. Intentionally being aware of what's going on, the thoughts, and it's like, okay, intentionally, like, uh, is that how... How true is that? How do I know that that's true? Whatever the worry was, right? Whatever is like, are they going to grow without me? Are they going to blah, 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 right? So I think it was very intentional. It's like, how do I know that that's true? Is it really true? Am I worrying? What am I worrying about? What, what kind of evidence do I have, right? And of course, the psychology that I mentioned at the beginning was with me also as so I became mother in my first years of motherhood. And he kept asking those questions. How do you know that that's gonna be true? What? So a lot of work, very intentionally step-by-step step, realizing that uh, the fact that I want to have a career does not, is not gonna make my child suffer or it's not gonna make uh, my motherhood experience a poor one. So very intentionally, I have kept that in mind to continue growing professionally yeah we're coming to the close of this session although we can continue having a, this beautiful conversation but i want to be mindful of those that need to go and be you know give lunches and dinners and <laughs> all of that other part of our lives um any like two pieces of advice that helped you or that have helped you or that you heard that, uh, you know, would be important to share today. Because again, we don't know what we don't know, but when we hear it from others, it sort of click from other people, it clicks in a different way that, you know, it can, it can make a difference. Uh, anybody want to start? I, I have two, two thoughts. Um, we mentioned before this, this construct, this idea of, of empathy. And you'd be surprised if you go to your leader and lay it out 
and mm -hmm. say, this is my life. I want to be the best in everything, but something's going to give. How can you support me so I can support you and do the work that's needed? just being uh, forthcoming and and open like that i did that um at a time where and i'm i'll say it like this um we 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 raise our kids and then at another point in life we have to take care of our parents which is something that i had to wind up doing and i had to go to my boss and say Here's what's happening in my life. Uh, I need this kind of help and support. I wanted you to know, and and he was he was really grateful that I said something. Otherwise, my change in behavior or my not being uh, prompt or my, my not doing the work he asked would not be coming. So, I laid it out, and empathy I think was something that he exhibited to me. So being open about it and telling the truth. That's, that's awesome. That's great. I think uh, just um, we need to get better at sharing what we want and what we need because we are super aware of what others want and others need. But at, at least in my case, I am very bad at, you know, telling people what I want and what I need and a very practical because I think it's important to live very practical advice. There's this guy that I follow on Instagram. His name is, I'm going to type it on the chat. So it's Jefferson Fisher. He's an attorney and he makes this 45 second video on how to be more direct, how to navigate a difficult conversation. I mean, the bombs of wisdom that's, that this guy, this guy throws to the table just, just blows my mind. So I follow this. I take notes, like, you know, when I'm going to have a, a, a tough conversation, <laughs> I'm like, oh, it, he's really, really good at it. So follow him if, if that's helpful. Like if you struggle to, you know, to have these conversations, this guy is fantastic. And just another quick advice to the beginning of the conversation about insomnia. I'm going to get super practical here. If you're struggling with insomnia, just because it, will, it made my life miserable for years. Mm -hmm. And this quick trick that I learned by yourself, you know, some iPods like the 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 cable iPods, not the not the, the the wireless, the cable. So otherwise, you lose them in bed. If you have insomnia, <laughs> plug them in. Uh, put yourself an audiobook, something that interests you. Because the worst thing you can do when you have insomnia is trying is thinking, "I need to go to sleep. I only have three hours left." Da -da -da. <laughs> it's gonna take you three hours, and it's gonna make your life miserable. Seriously, this changed my because you start stop thinking about your insomnia, you start paying attention to, oh, I like this. Uh, and in 20 minutes, you'll be, you know, it's like anesthesia. So, I've, you know, and many people that I've shared this with, they've done it and it has worked. So hopefully if you're struggling with it, it, it works for you. So just two quick pieces of advice. I love and that. Please, so, uh, and please drop you. the name on the chat because yeah. people are asking. Mm -hmm. Alejandra. Yeah, if, if you have any thoughts, definitely put everything in the chat because we'll build a resource of like recommended tools. Um, and then we can make a blog out of it uh, for everybody. Excellent. Yes, I think my, my two pieces of advice is uh, uh, I'll, I'll piggyback what uh, you said, said about learning. I mean, more than learning, be sure that you notice what are you feeling yourself with, right? I mean, the same way that you take, a, you are careful with what you eat, right? Um, supposedly, hopefully we would do that, right? The same way, uh, make sure that whatever you're feeling, what are you reading, what are you watching, what are you listening to, right? Of course, that's always very important to, to keep your mind and your spirit up. And also, I think that what I want to do is... Um, Years ago, when I was starting my speaking career, I I did a, a, a keynote for a group of 150, 150 women, and uh, it was it wasn't the best experience. The power went off. Uh, I was nervous years ago. I had a video, somebody videotaping. He was having some issues with the equipment. So anyway, but I had a I had a survey at the end. I did not read the survey results for a whole week because I felt so bad about that experience. It was not worth, did not work out. It was a mess. And a week later when I read the, the results, 
they were uh, the survey results. They were they weren't that bad. People actually learned one or two things from this talk, right? And I remember feeling, oh, I can do this. I can do it again, and I continue doing it. But it is it is, we we care about that, right? So then, sometimes we have to wait for others to give us that feedback. But I I, I invite you to don't wait. Keep what I'm sure you maybe you have heard this your brag book, right? Keep away a note, a journal to write down the amazing things that you do every day because from Monday to Friday, there's a lot of growth to begin with. And we don't know, we don't notice. So once, every once in a while, when you stop and you go back to that book, if it's a digital, whatever, a notebook, a journal, whatever, and you see like, oh, look at this. Then it's gonna feel like that feedback that I felt when I read those those summary uh, answers, those summary results. So keep that because that is really going to do, to bring your spirits even uh, higher. So that's my advice. Thank you for having me. That is wonderful. I'll share mine and then I'll pass it on to Sandra to close us off. Um, <clears throat> the biggest piece of advice that I'll share is what I, one of my earlier mentors told me is speak to, to always speak to your leaders or to you know people that are one or two levels above you to as a as a human right and learn yeah. what they have to offer because everything that we've heard here and more you can learn from there because nobody is perfect and everybody is just smiling on the forefront but on the back end they have the car that just broke down the breakfast that wasn't ready the kid that's waiting for them outside you know the whatever like the vacation that got canceled everybody has a story to tell and when you are able to have those conversations as human you'll see that you know we all have gone through that and they'll be able to share exactly what we've been sharing right now and then it just feels a little bit <laughs> not easier but at least <laughs> it gives you a little bit more of that grace and, and compassion that you're mentioning Dr. Pat at the beginning that we can have for ourselves if we see it on others um so that would be my my advice Sandra and uh, I'll close it off with just kind of mirroring what everybody said like we need to be and I love um Dr. Pat that you brought this up the empathy thing right when when I see somebody I'm always like if they're any certain way I'm like what are they struggling with right that's my mm -hmm. first question where's the humanity in them right because we mm -hmm. tend to think these people are perfect they got it all going on everything's like flawless and it's just me that I'm feeling off or me that I can't sleep right or me that I'm going through this and and it's really when we yeah. see the world when we stop taking the the attention like off of it's this is just me that I'm struggling with something and you look at the world as you know what is she going through right what you know and you just imagine whatever you imagine right but you think like what are they going through and you start you need to do that because you start to have more empathy for yourself right and dr right. pat we talked about this in our cafecito about that self-awareness right? right we need to be more self-aware we need to constantly like not put ourselves in this silo and then see the world as perfect and we're trying to acclimate to this perfect vision that doesn't exist right? The world is what we created. And when we understand that we are the direct creators of the world around us, if the world that you see around yes. you does not, does not showcase the world that you want to live, then it's you who needs to change, right? It's us that we need to look at ourselves and say, how can I be better? Number one, be more loving to myself, be more accepting to myself. Yes. Be, understand that it's not just me against this perfect world. It's all of us trying to find who we are supposed to be creating and, and what exactly our potential is, right? What is our potential? And that's so important for us to recognize because then you look at the world as, you know what, we're all, we're all dealing with some crap and we're all just trying to get by. But when we can be intentional about it, we're like, hold up, I'm creating this world and I have to share with my sisters that they also have the power to create and we do need to listen to podcasts and listen to thought leaders and listen to neuroscience and what that spiritually says that's so profoundly beautiful which is why i'm in love with neuroscience is is this yeah. beautiful spirituality that we are divine we are god we are the element we are god particles and we have the ability to number one i realize we are responsible it's not an option 
you are responsible to create the life that you want. So if the life that you want isn't before mm -hmm. you, it's up to us to change our thinking, to say, I love myself. I accept myself just, and I'm, and I'm awesome. And I'm looking at myself <laughs> in the mirror because if we don't do that for ourselves, ¿quién lo va a hacer? it's up to us in order to right. create the life we want. If all of us do that, man, we light up. We are like a light up a whole fire blaze, right? That, we can really impact the world and really make a difference to have people have self-acceptance for themselves, let alone for everybody around them. Right. So thank you guys. I, wow. <laughs> did you, did you <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you, Dr. Thank Pat. You, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, this is what this community is all about. It's a community of support, of sharing. Like we said, this is just the first of several conversations that we want to have. If you have any thoughts, any ideas, any other topics that you think are important, relevant for us to bring to the table, uh, please send us an email at hello at unitedlatinas.com. If you have any resources that you think are important to share with each other, send us an email or connect with us in the, in the Mighty Hub as well, uh, because United Latinas is exactly that. It's a community for us to know that we're not alone and that we have each other to be able to get to that top, whatever that top is. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day wherever in the U.S. or in the world Adios. you are. Have a good Bye. one. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.